In the late 1980s, a dark shadow fell over a train travelling to Tokyo. On that train, a man was returning home after an unsuccessful pitch for the game he wanted to make. The man's name was Shigesato Itoi. The game was Mother. Amongst many other ventures, Itoi was foremost a copywriter, creating taglines and catch copies for companies and advertisements. His work in the marketing industry made him something of a celebrity, notably for the Seibu department store's Delicious Life campaign, and for the taglines of many Studio Ghibli films. Sometime in the mid-80s, Itoi was bedridden with asthma, having to remain propped painfully upright to keep from coughing. Cooped up at home, he would play on his Famicom to pass the time, with games like Super Mario Bros. making his illness bearable. Video games had not yet achieved ubiquity in the public consciousness, and the burgeoning medium was under outside scrutiny. Itoi would appear on a talk show called 11pm to defend video games, speaking about his experiences playing Mario and likening games to the eventual everyday acceptance of manga. While initially not a fan of RPGs, that all changed with the release of Dragon Quest II, a game with which Itoi developed a fascination. This fascination spread to game development itself, as he started picking apart design choices. Of particular note, Itoi wondered, why did all RPGs use the same fantasy setting, with magic and swords and castles? An RPG set in a familiar modern world is difficult, magic would seem out of place, and having children running around with firearms is obviously problematic. He asked himself, if Steven Spielberg were to make an RPG, what kind of game would it be? The seed of an idea was planted. He started keeping notes on his ideas. A modern day world, an extraterrestrial threat, an average kid to face it all. Despite his extensive CV, Itoi didn't have any contacts in the games industry. He had a game to pitch, but no idea to whom he should pitch it. Hiroshi Yamauchi third president of Nintendo, and the man who transformed the company from a playing card manufacturer into a video game giant. He had seen the talk show where Itoi had praised and defended games as a cultural touchstone. At Yamauchi's request, Itoi was brought in to advise on the release of Nakayama Miho no Tokimeki High School, an upcoming dating sim. It was the chance Itoi had been hoping for. After the meeting, he was introduced to Shigeru Miyamoto. Itoi had brought his notes and launched into an exuberant pitch. This was what he was used to in advertising, starting with a proposal and filling in the finer details later. Mimoto's response was quiet, neutral, like he wasn't fully listening. He asked how Itoi planned to make it, how he would turn his concept into a game. Anyone can have an idea, but without the means to actually make it, an idea is all it is. Nintendo wasn't exactly wanting for proposals. Itoi's pitch was no different. Itoi left feeling crushed, believing the response was a rejection. He later recalled, I was really convinced I had something incredible, but once I realised it was going to require an actual ability to bring it to fruition, I felt as if I was turning back at the base of this incredibly enormous mountain. I cried in the bullet train on the way home. I didn't mean to, but it just came out, and I realised what it felt like to be completely helpless. Quietly, he returned to his life as a copywriter. And then, months later, he got the call. Yamauchi wanted to bring in outside talent, and so Nintendo put together the group that would become Ape Inc. Itoi had his team, but he still had a mountain to climb. The second time he and Miyamoto met, Miyamoto slammed down a heavy stack of papers, development notes from a text adventure game, showing Itoi how much he would be expected to write for his own project. He believed in Itoi and the game concept, but he was concerned, as Itoi was still a full-time copywriter. Video games are only as good as the effort put in. The practice of using famous names to sell games was becoming more prevalent, and Miyamoto didn't approve of the trend. If a toy couldn't give the project his full attention, it would be scrapped. 
The development team had similar misgivings. They initially believed Itoi would attend a meeting or two, then leave them to come up with all the details. He was, after all, a big name. There was no way he'd be mucking in with the rest of them. It was surely just another vanity project. This couldn't be further from the truth. Itoi made himself an integral part of the team, and Ape cultivated the close-knit atmosphere of an after-school club. Itoi wrote every line in the game, though as he was unfamiliar with computers, he spoke every word out loud to a transcriber, lending a natural cadence to his wordsmithing, and allowing him to judge the transcriber's reaction. This would become his trademark writing style for the Mother series. Development lasted only a few months. Originally called ESP-1, the title was eventually settled on Mother, named for a John Lennon song that had strongly resonated with the toy, and for being more feminine than other games of the time. The soundtrack, composed by Keiichi Suzuki and Hirokazu Tanaka, stands as an example of what the very limited Famicom hardware was able to produce. Mother released for the Famicom on the 27th of July, 1989. It was welcomed by critics, if not lauded, receiving a respectable 31 out of 40 by Famitsu. An English language version was more or less completed under the name Earthbound when it was abruptly cancelled, due in part to its particularly long and arduous localization process and the impending release of the SNES. Mother didn't see an official release outside of Japan until 2015, when the unreleased translation became available for the Wii U Virtual Console. But this very same version had found its way into the hands of Mother fans back in 1998 by way of an auctioned prototype cartridge, allowing the English-speaking world, through unofficial means, to finally experience a toy's masterpiece. Except, Mother is not exactly a great game. In fact, at times, it can even be a bad game. This is as much a subjective matter as it is objective, but I'm going to try to explain. Mother is somewhat a parody of JRPGs, taking notable inspiration from Dragon Quest II, but in practice it doesn't do all that much to set it apart from its contemporaries. Other than the setting and writing, it's a game that just wants to have a go at the genre, and as a result it plays very similarly and presents similar shortcomings. Perhaps the most glaring issue is highlighted very early on. Mother is difficult, in the worst possible way. The first enemies you encounter after leaving your house are able to soundly beat you. The philosophy of game design back in the 80s was significantly at variance with that of today. Games were harder back then. Difficult games made more money in the arcades, and home console libraries weren't quite so bountiful as they are today. When little Johnny No Thumbs only gets a few new games a year, they've got to last. Mother doesn't hold your hand through navigation or combat, you're supposed to figure it all out for yourself. There's nothing wrong with a hands-off design in theory, but games of that generation would take it to the extreme. The collection of the eight melodies is one of the primary goals of the game, but many of them are easily missable, relying on the player's patience and curiosity to find them. A bard in Magicant shares hints, but he's no harder to miss. It's not exactly the same as bombing every wall and burning every tree, just poking every cactus. While skill-based difficulty is one thing, this doesn't apply quite as much to RPGs, where you'll lose simply because the numbers said so. The only way to get better at Mother is the grind, something the game outright expects of you. The difficulty curve is less a curve, more of a roller coaster, as areas in the game weren't balanced appropriately due to lack of time, notably the infamous mounted toy. Of course, a player can simply grind levels to prepare for the next area, but due to a series of mechanics, 
this can become a very vicious cycle. The problem is that everything costs money. You get money from defeating enemies, or rather your dad deposits money into your bank account upon every win, which you can withdraw from an ATM. It's a neat mechanic that better explains finding gold from slimes, but in practice it gets pretty annoying. No, you can't just press A on an ATM to access it, no, you can't use check in your menu, you have to go to your goods, select your cash card, and use it. You always have to keep your cards in your very limited inventory just to access the money you earn, meaning you can't carry around as many hamburgers as perhaps you would like. And obviously, as battles are turn-based, you're going to accrue damage during more or less every encounter. You can heal for free at home and in Magicant, but you still have to mince your way all the way back to where you were, you're not able to warp freely until near the end of the game, so generally you have to pay to heal by buying food or staying at hotels, costing you a decent chunk of the money you earn just to recover health. You do learn life up early on, but Psy or PK moves require psychic points to use, and if Ninten faints, his psychic points drop to zero, meaning you have to pay to restore it. On top of that, if the whole party faints, you lose half the money you have on hand. This creates a barely manageable system whereby the process of earning money costs a huge amount of money. You're normally able to scrape by, but when you start earning more than you spend and splash out on better weapons and armour, which is a necessity, the edge that you gain in battle is weighed against a sharp decrease in financial stability, meaning if you faint again, no more PK moves for you. I know the game is set in America, but I get the feeling this isn't a narrative the mechanics were meant to present. All I can say is, thank goodness Pokemon centers are free. Even putting aside random encounters, navigation in this game is a pain. The overworld can be samey and confusing, especially on your first run, but it's still navigable. You generally have a decent idea of which direction to head. The factories and dungeons, on the other hand, are a nondescript labyrinthine mess, and exploration is discouraged further by, of all things, the controls themselves. Mother might be the clunkiest tile-based game I've ever played. Even setting aside the strange diagonal movements and the difficulty judging which tiles are impassable – flowers are solid objects, by the way – it seems that, rather than acting on the press of a button when it's pressed, the game has a set schedule at which it polls the controller, once every half second or so. This means that if you're not holding the button on that particular frame, the input will be ignored, no matter whether the button was pressed or not. All NPCs are also updated on this frame, making the simple process of walking up to something and pressing A a very frustrating procedure that permeates the entire game. The thing is, Mother is a product of its time. Game design was more standoffish, expecting players to really work towards mastery. So while Mother has its flaws, the extent to which these flaws will impact one's enjoyment will depend in part on how comfortable one is with the design philosophy of the 80s. It doesn't help that this relic didn't see an official Western release until 2015, after a full generation of Nintendo's Blue Ocean strategy. To take a similar example, Pokemon Red and Blue will seem alien and unforgiving to someone who grew up with Pokemon X and Y. Perhaps it is unreasonable to judge these old titles by the standards of today. Mother is remembered as a flawed game. It may have a better reputation amongst those who grew up with it in Japan, but by the time the English localization had leaked online, Earthbound had long since come and gone, a game that, as we'll see, improved on its predecessor in every way, leaving Mother a curio of a bygone age. But it wasn't for want of trying. Compared to other RPGs of the time, it's undeniable that there was a real effort to make a world that felt lived in. It was the first time a game's script had been written by an actual writer. Itoi's core involvement in the development of Mother is what made it such an important game, because despite gameplay shortcomings, Mother was something special. It tried something different, 
playing a part in the JRPG boom with its trademark strange, funny and heart-rending style. Exploring the world, talking to the people, encountering the enemies, visiting Magicant, the game has a bizarre dreamlike quality to it, as if it exists in a child's imagination. Back when most games put the barest effort into a story to excuse the gameplay, Itoi set out not to create a game, but an experience. It was hampered by a short development time and limited hardware, but nevertheless achieved a cult following. Perhaps it'd be remembered more fondly were it not for its more successful children, but had the series ended here, would it have ever left Japan? Earthbound and Mother 3 are genuine gaming classics. The effects of their impact are still being felt to this day. And behind it all, Mother. My name is Stefan. Thank you so much for watching.